The color blue is a symbol of hope and healing. The lighting of the blue candle today symbolizes light amidst the darkness of the crisis. It is lit to remind each of us as to why our individual contributions are so important in the fight against HIV and AIDS, as well as to serve as a reminder for us that hope is essential if we are to survive. I would like to ask all of you to join me in observing a moment of silence as we light our blue candle of hope in memory of those we have loved and lost in the AIDS crisis. May it also serve as a silent symbol of our commitment in the fight until a cure is discovered. On behalf of all of us at the Names Project New York Capital Region Chapter, we thank you, each of you for your contributions to ending the AIDS epidemic, both here in New York State and around the world. Good morning. I'm Eric Adams, Mayor of New York City. I'm honored to join you today to commemorate Rural AIDS Day 2022. New York City has been on the front line of the HIV and AIDS epidemic, and we have been winning that fight. I am proud that New York City was the first fast track city in the US to reach UN AIDS 90, 90, 90 goals, two years ahead of schedule. And as you'll hear later this morning, our groundbreaking efforts have produced real results. New HIV diagnoses in 2021 are down 23% since 2017 and down 73% since 2001. Internationally, the world is having a realistic discussion about the roadmap to end HIV forever. Let me say that again. In just one generation, we're talking about ending HIV forever. This is incredible progress, but we have more to do. Inequities continue to persist across many communities, including our Black and Latino communities. These inequalities have been made worse because of COVID-19. Too many communities and populations are being left behind. New York City, take this responsibility seriously, and we are committed to doing everything in our power to reach our goal of ending the AIDS and HIV epidemic. Just last month, we signed onto the Sevilla Declaration, committing to place affected communities at the center of urban HIV responses. The Sevilla Declaration includes 10 commitments ranging from safeguarding the dignity and rights of communities affected by HIV to meeting the United Nations goals for community-led HIV responses. We have the responsibility to lead the way to defeat this epidemic. Our cities are in a unique position to mobilize communities, invest in targeted interventions, and dismantle the systems of oppression that put people at greater risk of HIV. I like to say that we cannot be detached spectators in the full contact sport called life. We can't just sit on the benches. We must get on the field and fight together. So today, we recommit to ending AIDS and HIV once and for all. Together, we can solve the greatest threats to our humanity. The presence of antibodies is what they look for when they test for HIV. I was 22 years old in 1993, 10 years since the first cases had been reported about in NYC. 
now spread throughout its various communities, no longer them, because now it's we. But that didn't stop me from testing the breaking point of invincibility. I stepped into the room that smelled of sterility, where I waited for what seemed like an eternity to see what the results of my test would read. Your test came back positive, he said, nothing less, nothing more. Unable to look me in the eye, he stared down at the floor. He'd never delivered an HIV positive test result before. My impulse to bolt out the door was outweighed by the need to make sure that the doctor felt secure. So I stayed and I was counseled some more. Seven years to live were some words I grabbed onto, treatment options and not a death sentence were some others. Had I been another, I might have jumped in front of the two train like my girl Sharonda's little brother or hung myself in the bathroom with an extension cord like my boy Pito's baby's mother after they discovered that the baby had the monster too. But instead of suicidal ideation, I found that I had the will to live and that I actually possessed the power to forgive. Forgive myself for the choices I had made and the actions I had spoken. Forgive the one who infected me because he's dead and I have a long life ahead. Forgive my mother for her ignorance and for her religious convictions which allow her to believe in a God whose answers to drug addiction and homosexuality are AIDS and HIV. Forgive the doctor for his contradictions for his inaccurate depictions, for pushing mad prescriptions, for his seven year prediction, which caused me for some years to reside within my fear. It's been 29 years and I'm still here. It's been 29 years and I'm still here and I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Peace. So the first one that comes to mind is Richard. I just want to say thank you. <sighs> thank you for the love and support. Um, you know, I watched you. I watched you go from relatively healthy um, to, um, you know, I was a pole bearer at your funeral. And uh, you never gave up, you know. You fought. You wanted to live, you know, in between, like, medications that were available to you at the time in 1993 to um, medications that were experimental to, you know, trying holistic and, like, you know, natural remedies and whatever you could access. Um, because you wanted to live, you know, um, and at the same time being supportive of me while I was in the throes of just having come out and being rejected by my family. Like you, you became the father I never had in those three years. And so thank you for giving me paternal love and paternal energy and, and you know, while you were in the midst of your own struggle. So just thank you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I feel you with me sometimes. You come to me in my dreams, um, you live in my heart. Good morning. Thank you for joining this morning's World AIDS Day 2022 citywide event. I'm Dr. Sarah Bronstein, Assistant Commissioner for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of Hepatitis, HIV, and Sexually Transmitted Infections. It's my distinct honor to share our latest HIV surveillance data showing continued progress toward ending the epidemic in New York City. According to our 2021 HIV Surveillance Annual Report released this week, 1,594 people were newly diagnosed with HIV in New York City in 2021. 
up 14% from 2020, but down 23% since 2017, and down 73% since 2001. While an annual increase in new HIV diagnoses in New York City is atypical, the increase from 2020 to 2021 reflects a rebounding following the unexpectedly steeper drop during the first waves of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, when HIV testing services were less accessible and available to New Yorkers. Because of this, the number of new HIV diagnoses reported in 2021 may include diagnoses among people who had delayed seeking HIV testing during 2020 and were tested in 2021. Importantly, if we compare new diagnoses in 2021 and new diagnoses in 2019, before COVID-19, the pace of decline was consistent with what we observed in the five years before the pandemic. In addition to tracking new HIV diagnoses in the city, the health department estimates the number of new HIV infections each year. Estimated incident HIV infections declined 25% from 2017 to 2021, with men who have sex with men, or MSM, and heterosexual men ex experiencing particularly steep declines of 25% and 29% respectively. While these data demonstrate important progress toward ending the epidemic, inequities persist across many communities. Of all women newly diagnosed with HIV in 2021, 88% were Black or Latino Hispanic, and of all men newly diagnosed, 80% were Black or Latino Hispanic. Of all men newly diagnosed with HIV in 2021, 60% were MSM. Of all new diagnoses among MSM, 80% were among Black or Latino MSM. And nearly half of New Yorkers newly diagnosed with HIV in 2021 lived in neighborhoods of high or very high poverty. To drive the next phase of our ending the epidemic efforts, including addressing these and other inequities, the Health Department released the New York City 2020 Ending the HIV Epidemic Plan in March of 2021. The plan sets forth key activities organized around four strategies, diagnosing, treating, preventing, and responding to HIV, and two cross-cutting issues, addressing social and structural determinants of health and HIV-related inequities, and improving our HIV service delivery system. We have spent the last year identifying current programming and services that are responsive to the plan, as well as critical gaps we can address by launching new initiatives. One new initiative focuses on routine HIV testing in clinical settings. In February 2022, the Health Department awarded funding to four high-volume healthcare settings in New York City to implement and scale up universal opt-out HIV testing with the broader goal of making systems-level change to ensure sustainability of this service delivery model. Another new initiative is our PlaySure Network 2.0, the next phase of our groundbreaking PlaySure Network, which ran from 2017 to 2022. The PlaySure Network was a citywide network of over 50 HIV testing sites, community-based organizations, and clinics working together to promote patient-specific approaches to sexual health and HIV prevention. As the five-year initiative came to a close, we solicited feedback from providers and community partners on how to improve upon the PlaySure Network model and optimize its impact. Feedback we received emphasized the importance of using a human-centered design approach, strengthening health systems, focusing on equity, and rooting this work in the principle that inequities in HIV incidence and health outcomes are in large part due to the structural racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and other systems of oppression that affect HIV prevention and care and health systems more broadly. With this feedback in mind, in March of 2022, the Health Department launched the PlaySure Network 2.0, a multi-million dollar initiative to support agencies to deliver a comprehensive health package of HIV services using an equity-focused, client-centered, one-stop shop model. Currently, 18 agencies in New York City receive funding to deliver HIV testing, PrEP and emergency PEP, immediate HIV treatment and HIV primary care, STI testing and treatment, outreach and navigation services, and mental health, substance use, and other supportive services, all with a special emphasis on reducing stigma and inequities. One year ago, during our World AIDS Day 2021 citywide event, I spoke about the 40-year anniversary of the first CDC reports of what we would come to know as AIDS. I spoke early 
about New York Times coverage of the, quote, rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals and the, quote, new homosexual disorder worrying health officials. I spoke about the fear and confusion around how AIDS were transmitted and who was at risk, and about how labeling AIDS a, quote, gay disease had led to homophobia and other identity-based stigma and discrimination. 41 years later, a new public health crisis emerged, and with it, many of the same challenges we faced during those early days of the AIDS epidemic. The first case of monkeypox, or MPV, was detected in New York City in May of 2022. By the end of August, over 3,200 people in New York City had been diagnosed with MPV, accounting for over 15% of all diagnoses in the US. Despite early challenges, including a global vaccine shortage, we mobilized to build a citywide response. We disseminated prevention information, declared a public health emergency to allow the city to take swifter action to curb the outbreak, and partnered with providers and community members to develop a robust community engagement and outreach strategy. All summer, we were at pride events, at clubs, bars, at circuit parties, at health fairs and town halls, distributing educational materials and safer sex products, and helping people make vaccination appointments for MPV. We worked with CBOs to ensure their clients had access to MPV prevention information and vaccination appointments. And in August of 2022, we awarded $5 million to 28 CBOs to promote vaccination with a focus on LGBTQ people and people of color. By the end of October, New York City had administered over 148,300 MPV vaccinations. MPV cases had fallen from more than 70 per day in July to around five per day in October. This incredible success is a direct result of focused action and partnership by the health department, state and federal partners, healthcare providers, and critically, community members and advocates. We leveraged existing HIV community partnerships and infrastructure and applied the lessons learned from HIV, including developing a public health response that is rooted in equity and that meets people where they are. MPV provided yet another reminder of the power of working collectively, of our responsibility to optimize public health for those who need it most, to holistically and meaningfully assess marginalized communities' needs, to make sure they have a seat at the table and that we remain committed to transparency and accountability. We are energized and emboldened to apply these recent lessons to the next phase of our efforts to end the HIV epidemic in New York City. I hope you share our enthusiasm for what comes next. I worked on two different uh, projects for monkeypox, um, one of which I started, one of which I um, got brought on to and um, continuing to help out with. Uh, the first was a Google Doc that I created with a list of uh, different places to get the vaccination um, in different cities and states across the country. And that was really born out of the fact that um, when the rollout first started, there wasn't really a central location to find where to go. And, you know, I would repost things on social media for the cities uh, that I did see that were getting the initial batches of vaccinations. And as I started reposting, I started to get DMs about if I knew where to go in X city or Y city. And I figured instead of, you know, continuously Googling and trying to figure it out um, on the fly, I could just put it all in one central place and send that out to people um, and kind of say, save everyone a, a, a little bit of a hassle almost. And so um, what started with maybe five cities or like the initial five or six cities that got doses um, evolved into almost a, a Google Doc with almost every state on it, um, multiple cities and counties represented. Um, and it kind of went from me Googling certain cities when the rollout was slower to as the rollout picked up, um, my you know, Twitter and Instagram DMs just getting flooded with people sending me um, information about where they got vaccinated or where if they worked in healthcare, um, where their work was doing vaccinations and all these different pop-up community events. And it ended up spreading like pretty far. And um, I was really proud of that because um, while I helped 
you know, put everything in one central location. It was really everyone's effort in getting me the information and sending it to me. Um, and people were just so willing to help out and get the word out there. Um, because again, this central resource did not exist. And so it was kind of left up to the community um, to look after each other as you know we have historically. And so um, while you know the project was born out of frustration, um, and you know, I'm still kind of frustrated that you know it had to be made in the first place and it wasn't just an initial government response. Um, it was really beautiful to see so many people come together. Um, and want, you know, a project like this to succeed. Um, and it, it has since been expanded into a virtual map through the help of building healthy online communities. Um, and it's kind of taken on, you know, the second life of its own, um, which is also really exciting and something that, you know, I kind of hoped would happen um, when this started. I think that, you know, now that it is more, you um, user-friendly and hopefully accessible. Um, I'm really excited to see kind of what comes out of it. And I'm really proud of how it grew from, you know, a small Google doc into this like full-fledged website. And again, you know, immensely, immensely thankful for everyone who sent me information or reached out to me if I wanted to help. Um, it was truly like a collaborative effort and um, something that I did not do alone by any means. So I'd like to thank you, my participants who um, took part in my master's thesis a couple of years ago um, for being so open and vulnerable with your experiences with uh, disclosing your SARO status to sexual partners. And I'm incredibly grateful for the vulnerability and your honesty, and trusting me with um, being able to take your stories and take um, what you talked about in our interviews and condense it together to bring something into the world. Um, the publication that came out, it was just a small thing, uh, but I've received so much feedback, positive feedback from other people living with HIV who really resonated with your stories. And um, in a way, it helped them feel less alone in terms of their own experiences disclosing their HIV statuses. And so I know that that's an immensely personal thing and I am forever grateful that um, you trusted me to um, be on the receiving end of your stories and your histories. And I really thank you uh, just for all you've done to give back in a way to other members of the community. I am a, a clinical consultant to Kellen Lord. I was previously um, an employee, a provider on salary, and I kind of um, recently had reduced my, uh, my time, my hours to take care of other family-related things. But I, I think because of that, I was in a position to be, um, to be more available since a lot of the providers who who had to come to the response um, to MPV had full patient panels and were overwhelmed. And so um, what Asa Radix did was um, pretty genius. He got a call from Asa who said, you know, we're assembling this team and um, my role at Callan Lord is uh, I am the clinical liver consultant because I've done a lot of work with hep C. So I organized a team um, to make sure that hep C is treated at each site um, in an equitable way and that we're not missing cases and that we have a, a system to discuss each case that comes through and to get them treated as soon as possible. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I was honored when Asa called, but I was also sort of overwhelmed feeling like I don't really know a lot about this um, and I haven't been in clinic seeing it, but it, it was really, um, I think 
actually looking back a really smart thing to do because I could be a behind the scenes remote person. So I called Allie, who was the clinical research director and said, I think we need some kind of workflow. And, you know, the next day Ali had created this whole workflow and it was circulated. So who do you call? What's the process? Um, you know, the logistics of how do you organize around, especially a an investigational medication that's coming from the national stockpile. Um, and I think that also the clinicians wanted to prescribe it to everyone, but we also realized we needed to um, prioritize the, the sickest or the most at risk as we figured out how to streamline the process and, and, and make sure the ones with um, at risk for most progression would be tended to, you know, uh, kind of prioritize. So that was, I think that was tricky too. I think it was super success, successful at Kellen Lord because of only be, I mean, primarily because of good collaboration. You know, I think the only way that we could pivot when we needed to, to, to provide the kind of um, clinical, emotional, and pharmaceutical support to the patients that needed it. It needed to be a collaboration. And um, I was really impressed when, again, when I was covering for uh, the director who was at a conference, and then I, I was asked to communicate with the representative at the Department of Health that was making all of the phone calls to each patient every day was getting a check-in from the Department of Health. I thought this is really, um, this is the way it should be, you know, And but this response is above and beyond. And uh, the patients truly, when I spoke with them, really appreciated it. They, I, I um, got a lot of um, messages of gratitude and, you know, feeling that they, they had received the empathy that they needed through uh, the, this painful disfiguring process um, was so important to them. For our patients, that on another deeper level was really impacting them and what they have may have experienced trauma from, you know, HIV and the older generation, the, the AIDS beginning of AIDS. In order to get people the TPOX in a timely fashion, there was a lot of communication and and some pass off that needed to happen. And sometimes patients could not be at their own domicile to receive it for whatever reason. Um, so we did, one day we had, I think, uh, I felt was the most beautiful demonstration of collaboration when we had the, the Department of Health representative communicating with um, our, uh, our, our outreach team and our providers about how to get this single patient, his med, his TPOX handed off at Kellen Lord because he didn't want, he had a lot of stigma in his family. He didn't want them to know he had monkeypox. And he, so he didn't want it to go to his house. So this was a great way. Um, and also with the Pharmax, the pharmacy was involved. You know, there were, well, I spoke with Pharmax, they'll be here at two. And I remember we were all stressed because we were trying to make sure the patient got there, the medication got there, and the pass off occurred. But um, that was a group of caring individuals from different, um, you know, different organizations all coming together in real time. That was so beautiful, and that that's just one anecdote. So. Hi, Charles. I uh, want to dedicate this day to you. Um, you're forever on my mind and in my heart. And one of the first AIDS patients that really impacted me um, in your warm spirit, your kindness, and your recognition of uh, how I was trying to help you in a time when you were really suffering and there was little left to do. Um, uh, I really hope that you're at peace and I'm sorry that you had to exit at such a young age.
like a series of poems that's inspired by Robert Gober, who's thinking about HIV AIDS um, and people he's lost. Uh, shuffled slides of a changing painting. 89. You're still too close for me to write this. Listen. I whisper in the subway where a ghost of you passes in my periphery. There are landslides. I'm so corny, I laugh, hiding my tears under a hoodie. Stevie Nicks woke me up one morning and I was very young. How does it go? Something about mirrors, mountains. Listen. Now you tumble out of view, gone. 47. I feel heavy holding my breath. I light a candle and remember what kind of saint Michael the Archangel was. I would really like to open my back and drape my lungs over my shoulders. Can he make me that strong that I become soft? Alveoli, alveoli, alveoli wings. Twelve. Mama immigrated to New York by herself. Whiling away the days until my father could join her, she dreamed each passing plane was the one carrying him to JFK. Thirty-four. The wallpapers in the museum are loud with images that defy and demand language. Sometimes I feel like a white man, and then this is some other queer's loss, by which I think I mean I am tired. I've grown skilled in cruising for my story where my story does not exist. 30. A lonely binary is a switchblade snapping the body open, shut. Am I learning to love or aspiring to whiteness? 65. AIDS is not separate from 9-11, and yet why does my mind take leaps? A sink carries water, but elongated, a body too, half sunk in dirt, a sign for no longer. And just a few floors above us, Matisse's The Red Studio, painted in 1911, compels one's eyes to enter what is otherwise a flat surface and, haptically, to behold, a chair drawn this way, a clock. John, um... Thank you for sharing your uh, stories with me and uh, I feel like stories about surviving HIV and AIDS and um, creating through those struggles and how you formed connections and friendships um, even when you felt like you were, that there wasn't hope, I think. Good morning, I'm Dr. Ashwin Vasan, New York City's Health Commissioner. I'm so honored to represent the City of New York and its Health Department today in commemorating World AIDS Day 2022 and acknowledging our progress towards ending the HIV epidemic in New York City. Thank you to the Health Department's Bureau of Hepatitis, HIV, and Sexually Transmitted Infections for organizing today's annual citywide event. I'm especially excited to be here today and to celebrate our collective progress with you because I started my career working on global HIV AIDS, helping to expand frontline HIV treatment, training, and clinical programs, and improving integrated primary care and HIV care delivery in the developing world. But the impact of this public health work would have been limited without the grassroots HIV movement that fought so hard for advances in science, policy, clinical care, equity, and human rights for people living with HIV. So above all, I want to thank everyone participating or watching today who's part of the community of HIV activists, educators, leaders, advocates, providers, researchers, artists, and more. In short, the heroes of the movement to end HIV in New York City and beyond. 
You've inspired us not only in our continuing responses to HIV, but to every disease outbreak since, including the COVID-19 pandemic, and for the past several months, MPV, what we're calling monkeypox. And once again, New York City's LGBTQIA community led the charge alongside us. You've served as the most credible of messengers to the community, disseminating health information, combating misinformation about MPV, and encouraging fellow community members to get tested and treated, as well as to practice proven harm reduction and prevention approaches. And as a result, the city's response to MPV has been a success. Even with our share of setbacks and an unforced error or two, we managed to act quickly, widely, and effectively enough to turn the tide and to prevent a wider epidemic. And we did it in large part because of our partnership with the community and with so many of you joining us today. LGBTQIA plus people, the HIV community, and their staunchest allies recognize that public health is community work and that prevention and harm reduction are as essential as medical interventions in protecting everyone's health. So on behalf of my health department and my city colleagues and all our fellow New Yorkers, we cannot thank you enough for everything you have done and for everything we have to do together going forward. It's now my honor to announce our World's AIDS Day 2022 award recipients. They represent an extraordinary body of work, past and present, and are a broad sample of the kind of brave community building efforts that together lead to change at scale and move us closer to ending the HIV epidemic in New York City. Krishna Stone. Krishna currently serves as Director of Community Relations at GMHC. She connected with GMHC in 1986 as a volunteer and joined the staff in 1993, organizing community events and conferences. For eight years, Krishna co-coordinated the planning and implementation of World AIDS Day citywide events, leading a diverse coalition of End AIDS NY members and city, state, health department stakeholders, and ensuring high standards of success across venues and communities. Mika Daru. Mika Daru started her work with HIV in the 1990s, volunteering for many years before joining Housing Works, where she oversaw the communication strategy for the agency's policy initiatives and spearheaded coalition building efforts. For five years, Mika joined Krishna in co-coordinating the planning and implementation of World AIDS Day citywide events. She's currently Managing Director of Communications and Marketing at The Door, a comprehensive youth development services organization. This is my friend and colleague, Krishna Stone, Director of Community Relations at GMHC. And this is my friend and colleague, Mika Daru, HIV activist and former Housing Works Vice President of Advocacy, Communications and Marketing. We're humbled and grateful to Health Commissioner Dr. Vossen and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for this award for HIV advocacy work and for our years of planning and overseeing citywide World AIDS Day events. We both recall the dark early days of the AIDS epidemic, the decades when hope was limited to the wish for a precarious survival against the odds or the wish for a quick death with minimal suffering. We are privileged to work and serve within such a rich community, one whose activism and demands for social justice have made viable treatments and long lives with HIV possible. On World AIDS Day, we commemorate our dead, those we've lost to AIDS since the epidemic began over 40 years ago. We say their names out loud with love. We accept this World AIDS Day Award in their memories. Dennis Bowman, Curtis Wheeler, Christina Ramos. Sylvester, Sharon Red, Dan Hartman. Today, we also honor all those living with HIV and the many people who do tremendous service in this community every day. None of us does this work alone. We see you. We honor those who fight stigma racism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. 
those who work tirelessly to bridge the health disparities that drive disproportionate rates of HIV among black and brown people, men who have sex with men, and transgender women. Together, we make a movement of loving citizens who will end this epidemic. May we all be blessed with more life for the great work ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Kenyon Farrow. Kenyon Farrow is a writer, editor, and strategist with over 20 years of experience in public health, health care, social safety net, and social justice issues. He currently serves as managing director of advocacy and organizing at Prep for All a health advocacy and equity organization dedicated to eradicating HIV in the U.S. He's known for his impactful work with Fierce, Queers for Economic Justice, and TheBody.com, and TheBodyPro.com. In 2021, POZ Magazine named Kenyon to its POZ 100 list to honor his work as an HIV activist. Hey everybody, I'm Kenyon Farrow, and I just want to say thank you so much to the staff at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for one, honoring my work uh, on this World AIDS Day, uh, but also just for your work. I know the last three years have been particularly difficult uh, as we've dealt with a lot of uh, competing interests, right? One, uh, just maintaining the uh, programs and, and services that the city offers. Uh, to its residents, but also, um, you know, in the wake of COVID-19 and then the monkeypox outbreak, all of which has, uh, you know, made our work, whether as advocates outside, like myself or you as uh, staff, uh, really difficult. And so um, I wanted to say thank you really from the bottom of my heart uh, for honoring my work, uh, whether it's been on PrEP access issues or the New York City or New York State uh, in the HIV epidemic work. Um, but I also want to just honor the fact that I know that the last couple of years, there's been so many people who've done so many amazing things that they didn't think that they could do or would do, uh, given the state of, of infectious disease outbreaks in the world. And um, it's really an honor for me to be honored by you, what I consider to be one of the best public health departments in the country uh, for my work in this, this, uh, this, this uh, arena. So thank you so much for the award. Thank you so much for your work. And uh, hopefully we will continue to, to press on together in 2023. Thank you. ACT UP New York, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, popularly known as ACT UP, is, quote, a diverse, nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis, unquote. This year, ACT UP worked with the Health Department and the New York City Department of Education to ensure that students will have access to comprehensive, non-stigmatizing HIV education that is regularly updated for medical accuracy. They also continue to advise the health department on our crystal meth methamphetamine harm reduction program for priority populations. One of the biggest obstacles to stopping HIV is that the school and workplace lessons Americans rely on are rarely updated, causing mistrust. But what if we legally ensured HIV lessons were consistent and medically accurate? One possible method is having health department experts routinely check other agencies' HIV info. This model is durable, replicable, nonpartisan, and cost-effective. Every city in America can ask its health department to do this. The City Council Working Group of ACT UP thanks the DOHMH for this award and for taking steps to make our vision of routine medical accuracy updates a reality. We hope New York City is just the beginning and other cities across the country will be inspired to try similar models because all Americans deserve medically accurate HIV information in their schools and workplaces. We can't end the epidemic without it. Apicha Community Health. Apicha Community Health Center provides quality care and support services to New Yorkers, especially medically underserved communities. Apicha has been a leader in local and state efforts to end the HIV epidemic, advocating for the communities it serves and for preserving New York's health care safety net. Apicha has played a critical role in our MPV response, educating the community and linking clients to vaccination and treatment. Apicha has been actively engaged in the city's response to anti-Asian hate attacks.
On behalf of Apicha Community Health Center, thank you for this award. To end HIV, we know that to decrease new infections for Asians achieved in other communities of color, we need a category Asian further disaggregated into nations of origin. Only then can we create linguistically and culturally appropriate outreach strategies for the Asian and Pacific Islander communities at risk for HIV. I would like to end with a poem about Apiches' beginnings and aspirations. Pushed out by the mother of all epidemics, pulled by midwives, women of civil rights days, men, young and gay, joined by the first people of America, we cried, other no more. Baptized Asian and Pacific Islander Coalition on HIV AIDS, Apicha, rebel with a cause, called society on its blindness. You are born to be a keeper of brothers and sisters. Now in your early 30s, a federally qualified health center, still dreaming. Dreaming is about hope. Pills alone do not cure broken hearts and mangled existence. Hope is the element that unfastens a stifled soul. Dream to wash away the tears of a life filled with nightmares, a state-of-the-art safe space, LGBTQ sheath in love and care at the Apicha Community Health Center. Hopefully, dreams do come true. Thank you. La Nueva Esperanza. La Nueva Esperanza provides food and nutrition services to black and brown and Latino people in Brooklyn living with HIV in English and Spanish. They provide congregate and home delivered meals and nutrition counseling and education and support clients in accessing benefits and housing support. The team goes above and beyond to provide culturally competent services that acknowledge clients' diverse beliefs, values, and backgrounds. Hello. On behalf of La Nueva Esperanza, as board of directors, as executive director and staff, we'd like to say gracias, thanks, to NYC DOH Commissioner Vassan and everyone involved for making this award possible to our agency. Commissioner Vassan, Guadalupe Plummer, Brian Mazel, Graham Harriman, and many others, thanks for believing in us. You are all a panuelo, a handkerchief to La Nueva Esperanza. You have helped us stop the tears since World AIDS Day 2006 in a community devastated by twin epidemics, HIV and substance use. To our amazing staff, this is your testimony. It was once upon a time just a dream. To all others who added a grain of rice, together we made it reality. Te quiero. I want to take a moment to thank the New York City Health Department and the Commissioner of the New York City Health Department uh, for this acknowledgement of our work and um, how excited we are to receive this award, especially after opening the first two OPCs in the country uh, in our partnership with the Health Department. Um, and it's a blessing to know we've impacted uh, and reduced the spread of HIV as well. So it's important that, that uh, we take a moment to, for me to acknowledge our staff who are the ones who really do this work and um, embrace this award. I share this with them, I share this with our board. Thank you so much, thank you again. We look forward to it another another amazing year coming up. You're thank happy, you. guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On Point NYC. On Point NYC operates two overdose prevention centers located within syringe service programs in East Harlem and in Washington Heights. The sites offer health and wellness services, supportive services, and harm reduction education and outreach. On Point NYC's nation leading historic efforts to improve the health and safety of people who use drugs exemplifies New York City's commitment to forward thinking public health programming and services. The birds are chirping. Baby says, maybe, perhaps, it means the rain is done. 
Many I speak to feel like the earth is healing herself. Nia says she's purging and we're all a part of it. The sound of odd laughter or distant exchange, depending on the weather, depending on the day, are the more pleasant sounds that may cut through contaminated air and echo and wave, 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 wave. Don't shake. Those moments are seldom. It's mostly quiet humming now. More frequent are the sirens, even when chatting with friends and family. All this digital video correspondence is starting to make me feel unreal, like life is unreal. I hear the sirens in their backgrounds, in the distance, on Zooms, in this distancing. At first, it feels like regular everyday New York City noise, but that's during the day, I guess. At night, the streets are empty enough for ambulances to pass through without ever blaring a siren, so that all I see from the street window are emergency lights. I think I'm finally getting used to the true sight of red, white, and blue as we wait for governments to send capital, trusting systems who've done us wrong for so long. It feels backwards to do more. My anxiety is so high lately. I'll think I got something stuck in my throat. My world, it moves so fast today. The past, it seems so far away. And life squeezes so tight that I can't breathe. Funny how we all can't breathe now. The quiet that has fell upon this city is almost deafening. How desolate it feels to no longer be busy. No longer be doing the most for the least. No more skipping meals. No more overworking, overcharging, overpaying, convening, parlaying. No more hanging out without a doubt that you will go home when you want to. To think our previous reality is now a mere dream. A privilege, some luck we will need if we think of how even to get back to something anything like it was. We're exploring more theory and spirit. Bodies transmitted on boxes, my digits on phones and on clocks. Ran out of moans, had to cop from a member of community who knew me for my work and my poetry. Girls looking out for the girls. I said, well, hell, if this is still Mother Earth and this Earth is still God, then there's still some beauty. Octavia E. Butler taught me that we are seeds and that God has changed so we can be that beauty. But how do you contain what is meant to grow wild? They say we adapt, we be still. We was always inside. We always been inside. Boats, inside shacks, inside chambers, inside cages, inside houses. Sometimes in darkness through night trying to stay camouflaged. We've been inside in the back of everything inside. This should be easy for what our ancestors, for what our ancestors have been through. My Jamaican priestess pastor told me that we come from good bones. We come from strength. We come from genocides. We determine what's next. Sometimes I find myself in the fridge forgetting what I opened it for, dazing my mind in 20 places. <sighs> my mind in 20 places. Grateful for food, grateful for laughter, dazing. Worried for the future, saddened by death, dazing. Mirrors remind me how attached to superficial beauty I was. All, all those nights. <sighs> all those nights I pushed to pull, to put on, make up, and move through show. Now there's nothing I would love to do more. I wish we weren't such a fickle species. But then we wouldn't be hungry and full of knowledge, perhaps, and ideas and thought. I hear hel helicopters every now and again. They sent the same giant navy they sent to PR when that hurricane hit. This big boat to save the city and provide a beacon of hope only to accept three patients. A boat probably bigger than the Intrepid, wider than this very silly American system, looking like a big nurse joy floating on in. My brother called me today. He's serving time at a state psychiatric facility upstate. Apparently he's been arrested again for assault and robbery. I still haven't gotten used to people asking about my family so much. It's such a touchy subject, though I'm grateful for the sentiment. As we lose so many of our elders, I've gotten so much better at not crying. After I get off the phone, I'm not even sure if he's aware of what's happening in the outside world. 
As long as they're alive, I will say they're fine, my brothers. I have hope that I will teach again. So to my brothers, know this femme cannot help you today. For better or worse, I must stand away because everything I had feels halted, dismayed. So I must conserve my energy for me. I don't see the humanity. I see gen genocide waiting on balconies, population control. We must remember that fear kept slavery going, so I will not stay inside. But I will keep my immune system strong. I shall find a new way to somehow belong in this new world as we know it. I will try to stay strong in soul and in my spirit. But you know, I saw a man the other day after I finally went to visit the house I grew up in that someone had forced my mother out of and taken. It was cleaned and gutted. Best I'd ever seen it. New appliances, counters, floors, everything. No furniture, but each room was a different color. The back was still broken open. Me and my boyfriend, we snuck in through the backyard full of old tree stumps and cigarette butts. It feels nice to say. It used to be nice to say. Me and my boyfriend. But anyway, I cried about everything they threw away. All the memories I'll never have again. All the pain that happened. All the payments. All the history. All the debt. All the repairs. And we walked up aqueduct through and through. And there was a man on 183rd Street blaring disco, piercing through the stillness. Thelma Houston, don't leave me this way. And I couldn't help but dance. And I danced forward past him, keeping my six foot distance. And I waved. And he screamed over and over, forget Corona, forget Corona, forget Corona. That's right, you dance. And we watched each other a while. He watched me as I danced the way toward Fordham, looking backward at him play. Because all we could do was watch. It's like we wanted to touch because all we could do was watch. And not in a sexual way, just an embrace or a hug. Like we wanted to tell each other, it's going to be all right. Or like we wanted to tell each other, it's always been all right. Because we always been inside. Or like we just wanted to spin or bump or high five or maybe he did want to kiss me. Because maybe he hadn't kissed anyone in so long. Maybe he did want to hug me. Because maybe he hadn't hugged anyone in so long. I don't want to spend the rest of my life finding new ways to feel freedom. After our ancestors fought so hard for it. But I guess nothing is promised or entitled. I walked by the Hudson River with my dearest friend, Atifa. She gave me the name Linda. And she reminded me that hope, to hope is cute, but belief, to believe is better. I have been in the Department of Health almost 18 years, um, and I have seen a lot of changes. Uh, and one of the things that I really had always loved about working there is that I feel like there is always a lot of people that have a lot of dedication, that have a lot of love for the job. I think over the years working in DOH, I have come to as a gay man um, and HIV positive, I have, I have to always kind of really remember how it was before PrEP, how it was before rapid testing. And, and it's kind of like this, this amazing story, you know, like, like I remember when I was 18 and I started volunteering for HIV and I saw people dying. Uh, I took care of friends, clients, and I seen kind of like the changes over the years. It really kind of like always give me like a lot of happiness, uh, but at the same time made me very sad because there are a lot of people that I wish they will have not died so young. Uh, I lost a very good group of friends. And I believe that 
working in the department had helped me to really kind of uh, share my own story in my own experience in the years working with HIV. And that has been mostly all my adult life and my professional life. Um, we, one of the most important parts for me is like the opportunity to, to work with a lot of uh, the young people in the office. Uh, uh, I feel like I, I had been given the, the gift to kind of like interact with them, learn with them, and at the same time share some of my own experiences. And I think that is something that I value very much. Um, in my life, always has been this interaction between uh, trying to, to um, be in a, in a world where sometimes as an immigrant it's not easy, easy to find a place that really see you as the whole person. Uh, Alfredo, he was really someone, that, he was, you were uh, a very special person in the sense that you made me feel okay with being gay and okay with being sexually active. Uh, you helped me to kind of understand that AIDS was not at that time. It didn't really have to be the end of my sex life or I didn't have to live my, my life always afraid and uh, you always push me to push me to kind of find something new uh, that I explore and always told me that uh, you always told me that I I couldn't I, I couldn't approach life with fear I need fear couldn't control my life um, Ancona uh, he was you were you were one of the few people that uh, in Mexico City were so open about being HIV positive. This is this is 1988, and um, and I feel that you gave me that sense of like purpose on my life. You were the one that introduced me into volunteering for an agency in Mexico. You were the one that um, always tell me that I should work on the things that I love. Um, you love so much history and that's something that I took on me too. Um, you gave me much about that and I'm sorry that I was not there when, when you left this war, but the two of you have been maybe the people that more has influenced my life.